So if you know of anybody who has not joined the class yet and you're able to contact them, please remind them we started a new course today. We're going to the design course. Because it's a design course and it's paper-based, most of the labs that are in that course I will be making available over the time of the course because it's a lot of paper. The other thing is the construction blueprint reading book that I keep saying go on to Vital Source and get, that is, believe it or not, now available. I tested it this morning. It works. Um, so where, you, where some of you guys were getting an error message yesterday when you were trying to get that book, that book will now download to your bookshelf. Um, what you need to do is go through the link on Canvas that I showed you how to access yesterday. You need to um, click on that link, go through the process, and it will now take you to your bookshelf rather than give you an error message. If you have a problem where you're getting an incorrect student ID number, send me an email. I'll give you the correct one. I have no clue how they came up with the student ID numbers that they use in the book order process. But again, I will give you the correct one. It takes me two seconds to look it up if you don't have it and if you need it. Okay, it's a seven-digit number or six-digit number. Um, and the number, the last digits of the number match those numbers in your email address. But again, I'm happy to solve the problem. Just you have to tell me that there is an issue, and I'll, I'll work with you and get that book. So please go get that Construction Blueprint reading book if you haven't already, because probably starting next week, we're going to start working with that book. Okay, I did some rearrangement of the course to get us through this week without it. Any questions on that? Um, hey, Chris, did you say that it's supposed to be like a, uh, a seven-digit number on your it's either card? A six, it's either a six- or seven-digit number, and yours will end in 542, okay? It always goes – It's the la it includes the la those three numbers in your email address. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's not the number that I have on my card, so if I could, um, like, link up with you through email – later yeah let me ask you a question are you signed into the course room because I may be able to tell you how to get that number are you signed into yeah. the course? yes sir okay can you are you able to click on the people link that's on the left menu people link on the left menu there's people uh, no I don't, I don't see people I see files um, is it in the course yeah there it is yeah, yeah. in the course it's right under grades Okay. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. Do you see a column in there? It's right after your e it's right after like your email address. It says an SSID number. I don't know if you in, see the same screen I do. No, not not in people. All I see is like a list of all the people that are in the same class. Okay, but you don't Okay, can you click on your name there? Yes. And it just says, like, submissions on the left. Okay. Yeah. Um, just so you know, I don't want to – I'll link up with you later. Just send me a quick message or something, and I'll respond with – I don't want to say it on this conference because, again, I am recording this. So I'll, okay. I'll link up with you and give you – again, anybody who needs your ID number, just let, let me have it. Just let me have an email real quick, and I'll get it to you. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, back to back to this, back to where we're at. Okay, we're starting a new course today. Our primary topic for the next two days is psychometrics. Okay. Now, it's not the most exciting thing in the world to talk about, but I, but it ha all has to do with the sizing of air conditioning equipment. Okay, because I'm not sure if you've heard me say it before or somebody said it to you in the past. Um, air conditioning is not only cooling the air, it is dehumidifying the air. So a lot of what we do in air conditioning has to do with dehumidification and then cooling. So we're doing both a latent heat and a sensible heat removal in this process. 
So the best technicians out there understand. They don't necessarily carry the psychometric chart, but they understand how this all works as air flows across a cold coil. So what I have on my screen over here, and I'm hoping everybody can see it, is the psychometric chart. Now there's a number of different versions of the chart. Okay, you have um, versions that are very small that don't have a ton of extra lines, and then you have versions that are much more readable. Okay, all of them have dry bulb across the bottom. So in other words, if you are standing in a room and your thermometer says 70 degrees, your dry bulb line is what you're basically looking at. Okay, so you're looking at this line that goes top to bottom, straight up and down, that's by the 70 degrees. That's our dry bulb line. So everything you're doing on the chart with the dry bulb is at that 70 degrees. Okay, so that's number one. Then we also have wet bulb lines. Okay, and we have humidity lines. So the lines with the percentages, the ones that are curved, are the humidity lines. Okay, 10% relative humidity, 30% relative humidity and so on and so forth, all the way up to our top line, okay? And let me just, I'll put an arrow in here so you see it. This top line is 100% relative humidity. Basically, you're standing in a rainstorm, okay? Now, the numbers across this, the numbers on this line here, Okay, on the top line here, on that curved line, the numbers on that curved line are all about wet bulb temperature. Can somebody tell me how you take a wet bulb temperature? Anybody want to guess? How do you take a wet bulb temperature? Temperature probe, I guess. Yeah, but there's something special about that temperature probe. It's got, okay? something, wet over, it's got something wet over the end of it that that's sends the temperature. That's exactly right. If you are using a standard thermometer, you take a small piece of um, cotton, like a shoelace, <clears throat> okay, or something like that, and you put it over the probe and it's wet with water. Okay, now if you're using digital tools, Okay, you can get that wet, wet bulb temperature just using the digital tool. So I'm pretty sure most of you, depending on when your start date was, because the toolkits change as we progress, got a yellow tool that's into your toolkit, okay? It's a psychometric tool. It will take both wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures with the one, with the one tool. It's a psychrometer. Okay, so that's one way to get the wet bulb temperature. The other way to get your wet bulb temperature, again, is take your temperature probe, like the one that's on your meter, put a small wet, like a piece of a shoelace that's sort of hollow and you can get wet. You put it over the end of the temperature probe and you're able to get your wet bulb temperature. Wet bulb temperature all has to do with how, how fast the water evaporates. Okay, because remember, as water evaporates, we cool. Okay, so as evaporation is a cooling effect. We're removing heat from the area around it, and we're adding heat to basically evaporate the water. So we're moving BTU. So wet bulb temperature is usually under dry bulb temperature. Questions on that? Okay, so our wet bulb temperature lines, okay, if I take a, if I take a wet bulb temperature, and I come down, let's say my wet bulb is at 65 degrees. So I'm now saying my, I have my dry bulb and I have my wet bulb temperature. Okay, where they cross is my humidity. So you find the location of where they cross. 
and let's use green. Okay, so my cross, oops, I want to throw a circle on there for you guys. The point of crossing, where they cross on the line here, is my humidity. So if we take a look at where my humidity is, okay, my humidity, remember, is that curved line. Okay, so this curved line that I'm going to draw this arrow to is between the 70 and the 90. So that curved line is 80% humidity. Questions on that? Yeah, I don't see it. Wh which part of it did it? Where did I lose you? I came in kind of late, but you were saying from the wet bowl, you said humidity. I'm trying to find out. Oh, I see it now. All right, I see this 90, 80, 70. Oh, I see it. Okay, you you see it? Yeah. Okay. So where those lines cur cross is our humidity. So this is a 75% humidity. Now, if I take that wet bulb temperature and if I lower it, let's lower that down to about a 55 degree wet bulb. Okay, and then I take my line crossing. What did that do to my humidity? Dropped it. Dropped it pretty seriously. It's between 30 and 35 percent. Okay, when you're looking at humidity, you always round to the nearest line. I don't want you guys to try to estimate where exactly where in there is. It's actually closer to like the probably closer to the 40 percent right there, because this line, the line right above my cross, there is the 40 percent line. So I would just write it up as a 40 percent humidity if I were looking at a chart. Now, what do you think air conditioning does? Okay, we come into an air conditioning unit with, let's say, 80 degree air. Okay, so I have 80 degree dry bulb. Okay, I might have a 65, a 65 degree wet bulb. Actually, let's go higher. I might have a 70 degree wet bulb. So where this is crossing... is my is roughly around 65% humidity. Everybody see that? Okay. So when, once you come out of the evaporator coil, okay, which is the coil that's cold in there that we blow the air across, your air temperature leaving that coil might be 55 degrees dry bulb. Okay, with a wet bulb of, um, let me just find, let's say 50 degrees. And I need to change one of those line colors. Okay, so my entering is 80 degrees, 70% humidity, or 70 degree wet bulb. My leaving is 55 degrees, 50 degree wet bulb. What's my humidity right there? It's like 80. Uh, 80. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very close to 80. You start getting the lower portion of this chart, it's sometimes hard to see it. But you're you're right. It's someplace right around 80. Let me change that again. Okay? So what have we done? We've cooled the air, but the air coming off the co coil actually has a higher relative humidity percent. Now, that sounds counterproductive, right? Okay, I mean, we want a lower humidity, but that's not the humidity in the room. That's just the humidity as part of the cooling process. When this air goes out into the room and mixes with the rest of the space, its temperature is going to come up, 
but our wet bulb and our humidity, our wet bulb is still down, so we don't have as much moisture in the air. Okay, because we have a third column we have to, we have another column we have to worry about. Look on the right column of the chart that I have on the screen. Eh, once again, I want it to circle. Okay, we have another item over here. Grains of moisture per pound. Now, grains of moisture, when you start doing your reading and watch the other videos we have for you, grains of moisture has to do with um, how much water is in the air. Okay, you would think it would just be easier to say one cup of water, one teaspoon of water. No, they talk about grains of water. Okay, so it's grains of water per pound of air because air has weight. So when we start off here, okay, when we start our whole process, we have, we start off here. We started our cooling process with about 95 grains of moisture per pound of air as we're coming into the coil. This is my return air. That's the air coming into the system. We leave our system with roughly 48% or 48 grains per pound. So do we have less moisture in the air as we leave the system? Did I lose you all? Yes, you lose. Where did I lose you? No, not no, lost not us. Lost you, us. I mean, I'm sorry, your grain decreases. Okay. Yeah, so I have less moisture, even though my wet bulb, my humidity is higher in that discharge air because the temperature is lower. I've removed, okay, close to, oh, let's just say 50, 50 grains per pound of air. So I have dehumidified. Now, where does that moisture go? Where does that water go? And I'm pretty sure I have some people who, well, where does the water go when, when it comes off a coil? We've probably talked about this in, air, in refrigeration as well. Where does the water that cut, comes off the evaporator coil go? There's a drain. Yeah. There's a drain, yeah, it's a condensate drain. Okay. So part of this whole process is not only seeing the amount of water that comes off, there's a calculation that tells you how much this translates to in an hour of cooling. So when we're designing larger systems, when we're looking at dehumidification, one of the things we have to take into account is the drain size, where this water's going. Okay, so that's a pretty important aspect of this whole thing. Any questions on what I've gone over so far? Who can tell me what the word enthalpy means? You guys did go over it a little bit earlier in the refrigeration courses. What is enthalpy? Anybody? Isn't it the amount of heat that something can hold? Yes, that's exactly right. It's basically the amount of heat in a substance. It's in BTUs per pound. When you guys talked about it in refrigeration, you were doing some enthalpy calculations on, um, on food stuff. Okay, we were talking about how much how much heat we had to remove to cool a substance. Okay, so but in the case of um, air conditioning and building design, it's the amount of heat the air, which includes the moisture, holds. Well, our psychrometric chart also has enthalpy numbers on it. Okay, so again, air has a ton of properties. So one of the things we can do is we can actually see how much how much enthalpy that air has 
and we do this by using the chart okay and it actually extends the wet bulb number so my starting error has 34 BTUs per pound my leaving error is probably if I extend this line up and actually drew it straight we're right around 20 does everybody see that the green lines here so we have 34 and 20 this was my return air up here at the top temperature that was the air coming into the coil we then have my supply air which is the air right there well let's change that okay the green line is the supply air that's the air coming out of the system the difference between these two numbers is how much heat I've removed so 34 subtract 20 from it I've now removed 20 BTUs per pound of air that's just to cool and dehumidify the air okay questions on that okay where does this come into sizing an air conditioner anybody please how does this guess, play into sizing an air conditioner I guess you're talking about what the vents and how about just the size of the compressor okay does my system so, need to be able to handle this much removing this much BTUs per pound of air And also, like the, the size of your evaporator coil and your, your condenser yes, coil, right? Yes, 100%. It has 100% to do with remove with how much how much heat we have to remove for the air going across it. By the way, what I just described is our cooling process. Okay, it's known as the cooling process. Some of your homework questions and stuff like that are going to ask about it okay so the difference between the different measurements is my cooling process if anybody wants to take a snapshot of this screen please do because I'm going to move on to something else because this may act this what I just did is going to help you with something you're going to have to do later okay so let me clear So you're saying that it has to do with something in the uh, discussion? It has to do with something in the discussion, and there is a lab I'm going to have you guys do. Okay. Okay. I I do need I do need everyone to have a pretty good understanding of um, what the what the psychrometric chart does and stuff like that. So. Yeah, that's going to be a pretty important one, but I just let me clear off my lines here. There's no easy way to do this other than click on them and Why are you doing that? What book are we out of? You're going to you're going to be using two books on this course, actually three books on this course. You're going to be using the modern refrigeration. I put in I put in the notes for today in the announcement for this morning. I want you guys to start looking at chapter 27. Okay, you're then going to be using um, you're also going to be using the math for HVAC book. 
okay? Um, you have a couple, we have a couple things in there we have to do. And then finally, you're going to be using the, the construction for blueprint, the blueprint reading for construction book. That's the critical one that I really wanted you guys to make sure you get. Okay. But again, we're not going to use them all at the same time. We are going to alternate back and forth between them. And that information is always in my course announcements. I really believe in putting a lot of stuff in there. Okay. Now, we have what's known as a comfort zone. Okay. Again, pretty critical. We have what's known as a comfort zone. Okay. Our comfort zone is starts at about 70 degrees with a 30% humidity. Okay. So, again, if I plot my comfort zone, Okay, we're going to be at a 70 degrees, roughly 30% humidity, which is right there. That's the start of my comfort zone. From temperature, from dry bulb temperature, my comfort zone goes up to 80 degrees and again with 30% humidity. Now, we have a top level of our comfort zone. Again, with the 85 degrees, we don't want to go above 70% humidity. So my line is about right there. Okay? So, and then we have a lower end of comfort zone, which again is 70% humidity at 70 degrees. So we come here, Okay, and we see where that 70% humidity crosses. So those are the four corners of what we consider comfortable for humans. So if I draw a line here, and I'll put those corners together. Okay, that is what's known as the human comfort triangle. Okay, so when we're designing systems, we try to always design within these ranges, okay? And if you think about where you're comfortable at, and where other people are comfortable at, that's why it's such a wide range. Okay, so we want to make sure we are always designing within human comfort. Okay, because if you're too humid, if you're in a too humid of an environment, you're going to feel hot. If you're in too dry of an environment, you're going to feel cold. Obviously, below 70, below 70 degrees, a lot of people start feeling cold all the time. Above 85 degrees, it's too uncomfortable, okay? So that is what they refer to as the human comfort zone. You want to be within that human comfort zone. Any questions on that? Now, let me ask you a question. If you're in a big building, okay, how do you keep within that comfort zone. How do you, let's say we're designing an office building. Let's say we're talking about a big air, con, a big system where there's many different people, many different age groups. How do you as a technician decide if the system is working properly or not? There's no wrong answer, so let's let's talk about this. Anybody? I would say depending on the uh, the complaints of the people, like if they're comfortable or not. That's one way. Keep going. Anybody else? I would say if it falls inside of that zone we just drew, it's or closer towards the middle would be better, I'd say, maybe. Yeah, there's that middle. I don't know if you can see it. It's very small on these charts, and on some charts that you'll look at, it's just a little point. Do you see that little circle that's in the middle here? Yeah. There's a little where my arrow is right now. 
That is the absolute center of my psychrometric chart. The closer we can get our humidity values to that point and our temperatures, that is the absolute center. Now, the reality is, you brought up, one of you brought up human comfort, okay? If you have a big building, nobody is going to agree on comfort. Just think about what happens in your own houses. Nobody agrees on comfort, okay? So you have to think about, okay, what was the building designed as? What does the building managers want you to do? So think about down in this range here. Let me circle Okay, if you're in this range down here, okay, who is going to be the most uncomfortable people is the slow, the, when you get to the lower end of the chart? Who is going to express the most discomfort? Women. The people who aren't moving around. The elderly. Women. Yeah, women. All of those answers are, well, the elderly. all of those answers are somewhat correct. People who are not moving around, women tend to be more uncomfortable down in those lower temperatures. And and the elderly definitely have problems in those lower temperatures. And I just want to – we have to think about building use because we're no longer just talking about residential. We're also talking about commercial. In an office building, when people are just sitting around, they're going to be uncomfortable at these lower temperatures. Okay, if you were in a warehouse environment where people are on their feet moving all the time, tossing packages around or moving stuff around, building stuff, these lower temperatures are going to be very comfortable at. Now, if I go up to this area, who is going to be your uncomfort? Probably everybody. The people. younger people tend to be more uncomfortable at those temperatures. So the reality is, can you make everybody happy? No. No. Okay. I use a term that when I'm talking about design very frequently, I call it thermostat wars. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Everybody changing the temperature? Yeah. Okay. For, for example, when you're in your own house with your family, you might be hot or cold. You turn the temperature up. Your spouse or significant other may be cold. They come back and then turn it the other direction. Okay, the minute you turn your back, it's called thermostat wars. It happens in commercial buildings. That's why we need to actually we lock out thermostats quite frequently in commercial buildings. Um, there's a bank building. There's a bank headquarters building, Barry Savings Bank up in Massachusetts, that probably when I was in the field 15 years ago, I was the controls guy, and I went and wired that computer control system, nice system, building management system. Every, there wasn't a single thermostat visible throughout the entire building. We spent more time in that building on service calls because everybody was claiming to be uncomfortable. They were cold. They were hot. I mean, it was bad. So one Saturday, while the building was closed, we went up and installed a whole bunch of thermostats just all over the place. They were digital. They lit up. I put the, We wired them to a transformer, made them look like they were operational. Too bad they didn't control a thing. But, you know, our service calls 100% dropped. We had zero service calls after we did that. Okay, it was a matter of giving people control over their environment. Even though it didn't do a thing, they just had control. And we still do that with some of the digital thermostats. If you ever look at a thermostat that you're installing, you can actually make the temperature display something that it isn't. Okay, in other words, I can say add six degrees to the temperature displayed. It's all in how you set it up. But this is important to realize. This is my human comfort zone. And I think some of your ho some of the assignments we have upcoming will talk about this. Any questions on that? Okay. Now the other thing is air has weight. 
okay? And I just want everybody to be aware, air has weight. So we need to a little bit talk about um, how much air weighs. Let me just find something here. And I actually think that's in your tomorrow's lecture. So just just be aware that air has weight. Every time we talk about enthalpy, BTUs per pound, air weighs different amounts, okay? We have a dry air weight. We have a wet air weight. That's two different numbers. The more moisture you have in the air, the heavier it is. Why do I care about air having weight? So it can move. Well, how much effort it takes to move. It's more, okay. Okay. So how much effort it takes to move. Now, these lines coming across at an angle. Okay. We have lines coming across at an angle. The bottom one is like 12.5. Okay, then we go to 13.5. Then I go to 14.5. I don't know why they didn't bother to label the 13 and the 14 in the middle here. Okay, those are volume lines. Okay, that's a specific volume line. In other words, how many cubic feet of air per pound? Okay. Again, so we're looking at cubic feet of air per pound. So if I compress this air as tight as I can compress it, okay, it's cubic feet per pound. That basically, as our humidity increases, uh, okay, as we move up in the chart, our basically our cubic feet per pound goes up. Okay, those are volume lines, and we're going to talk more about that. So that's probably enough at this point to talk about the psychometric chart for what you need for today. Does anybody have any questions? Because there is a lab available that I am having you guys do. Okay, and I'm showing it on the screen right now. I'm not going to do this right now for you guys because I don't think I need to. If I just went through a couple examples. You're going to find on your psychometric charts where these different points are. Okay, I'm giving you dry bulb wet bulb, giving you dry bulb dew point, by the way. Okay, is sort of like the, is sort of like the wet bulb. Um, Okay, so I want you guys to make sure you do this lab, get it turned in. Okay, it says show me your charts. Give me the point values. Okay. Where we can find the synchrometric? The psychrometric chart? Yeah. Let me yeah. show you where let me show you where it's at. Let me just pull up the course here real quick. Give me one give me one sec. Okay, I've given you two, you have two charts. Okay, I'll tell you which one I like better. Okay, this is in today's material. It's under the uh, modules for the, that says trigonometry and psychometrics. Okay, um, it's down under the supplemental resources. Okay, the psychometric chart and the ACCA psychometric chart. The one that I have on the screen that I've been using is the ACA psychrometric chart. I really like that one because it actually shows a little bit better on the screens. Has is a little clearer. The other one that's there has a lot more on it, but I don't think you can see some of the lines there. So that's why I'm not using that one. Okay, so again, in your in your course Okay, there is two psychrometric charts, and it's under supplemental resources there. Questions on that?
Okay. Now, we do have to look at a couple, much as I hate to say it, we do have to look at a couple. Um, I have to do one PowerPoint with you guys today. Um, we do have to get everyone on the same page about some measurements, okay? Um, I know most of you guys have had this before in um, probably high school, I hope, or even before, but I, I really I need to go over it so everyone's on the same page. If I go over any of this stuff and you don't follow me or if there's something that we need to basically look at again, um, ask, okay? There's, there's no... There's no nothing wrong with asking a question if we go over this stuff. But if everyone's on the same page, at least I know everyone has the same background. Okay, you're not going to be able to do anything in the field without measuring. Okay, we're going to measure duct work. We're going to be measuring weights. We're going to be measuring temperatures. Now, we are the last country in the world that is still on the U.S. measurement system. Okay. On the on the standard on the SI system, we're we're the last we're basically the last person in the world. Okay, now a lot of the equipment that is coming in is coming in with metric measurements. You're going to hate that, okay? But you talk about the Mitsubishi systems, um, the ductless splits, some of the window units. You're going to find out that they come in with metric. Okay, so just keep in mind it's not everything is going to be based on inches and pounds. You're going to be sometimes dealing with meters and um, kilograms as well. Okay, you do have to be able to use a calculator or something to go back and forth. Okay, so again, tradition, we're the last one. Okay, this is in your handouts for this. The handouts for this PowerPoint are up on the, are in the course in that, okay, this is a really good conversion system. Okay, and I would just, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but it gives you an idea of how to convert between one measurement and another. Okay, so just be aware that that's there. Linear measurements are distances. Okay, linear means we're measuring a line. You have the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. When we say a ceiling is eight feet high, we're stating that the line is drawn from the floor to the ceiling. It would be eight feet long. Anything that can be measured using a line can be expressed as a linear measurement. Distance is measured in yards, feet, and inches using the traditional English system. There are three feet in a yard, 12 inches in a foot. Longer distances are measured in miles. A mile is equal to 5280 feet. That's an exam question someplace. I'm pretty sure it is. A mile is equal to 5,280 feet. Okay. We have a yardstick. A yardstick is three feet, which is 12 inches. Now, this sounds like rudimentary, but you will not believe that when I give, I, in the past, I've given ruler quizzes where I've taken a picture of a ruler. So let me pay attention. On it, Okay, and people cannot figure out where things are on a ruler. Okay, so when you look within an inch, okay, we start off within an inch, we can break it down to half, quarter, even eighths and sixteenths. I think your tape measures go down to sixteenths of an inch. Just So just know how to find these different measurements. It's pretty important. Okay, fractions of an inch. Area is used to measure a two-dimensional two measurement, such as a surface. Could be desktop plots of a land or the floor space of a building. The term square is used when describing an area because area measurements are broken down into several squares of a certain size. For example, a square foot represents the area of a square with size of one foot. Okay, one of the things we have to look at is if we have a building that's 10 foot or a shed that's 10 by 10, 
that means 10 feet by 10 feet, which is 100 square feet, right? No question on that. Now, is the roof going to have the same square footage as the floor? You're looking at a shed, which, have, which has a sloped roof on it. Is the roof going to have the same square foot area as the floor? No. No. Okay, so this is something as we start talking about load sizing, as we start talking about heat loss, we have to remember that anything with a slope is not going to equal the same square foot as the base. Okay, because it's going to, because of the slope requirement, it's going to be slightly larger. So my roof is not going to, unless it's a flat roof. If it's a flat roof, it's golden. It's the same square foot. But my roof area will not be identical. You're going to have to be able to convert between square feet and square inches. Okay, an example of this is when you're calculating airflow in a ductwork. Okay, we have to go from square feet to square inches and from square inches to square feet. Yeah, it might be logical to assume that there's 12 line. inches in a foot. Next, I draw a thick line through my relative humidity, which is represented by curved hey, lines. I see where these two lines intersect, and I draw hey, a guys. dot. Then I draw a horizontal line through the dot and see where it intersects. Yeah, whoever was off mute there playing one of my videos, I'd really appreciate if you put yourself on mute. Okay, so multiply, so yes, there are 12 square inches in a foot, since a square foot is one foot wide and one foot long. But a square foot can be divided into 12 rows of boxes, with basically with 12 boxes in each row, because you have 12 inches in a foot. So multiplying 12 pi 12, you convert one square foot to 144 square inches. Okay, don't, don't get confused on this because a square foot is one by one. But if you take that to inches, we have to know that one square foot is 144 square inches. And if you can get that, if you can get that number into just memory, you're going to be fine. Okay, one square foot is 144 square inches. To convert square yards to square feet, the same rule applies. Okay, there's three feet in a yard, so you're going to convert the yard to feet, and you'll get three by three. Okay, so five square yards can be converted to square feet by multiplying 5 times 3 times 3 for 45 square feet. All of these conversions you are going to use. Okay, not just in class. You will use these when you're in the field. So this, this type of math is sort of important. The floor space in your home is measured in area. Okay, we need to know how, when we talk about area, floor space, it's at square feet. Okay, while filter, grill, and ductwork is measured in square inches. To convert from square inches to square feet, divide it by 144. For example, a 16 by 16 filter has an area of 256 square inches. To divide that by to square feet, you're going to go 256 divided by 144 is 1.78 square feet. Again, we have to worry about this when we're talking about airflow and ductwork size. That's why this is important. Volume. Who cares about volume? Okay. Volume is a measurement, is another property we have to measure. Volume is for things that take up space. When we're designing air conditioning, air conditioning ductwork, heating systems, we might want to actually know how much volume is in a building, how much space I actually have to cool. Cool. It's three-dimensional. Length, width, and height. Okay, that's volume. Length, width, and height. Volume, we use cubic measurements, okay, because we have three measurements we're putting together. That means it's cubic. 
Cubic measurements subdivide an object or space into equal size cubes, such as cubic feet or inches. I think it's just easier to remember length, width, and height. So we have a box with a base of 4 by 6 inches and a height of 10 inches. Okay, if we were just talking area, we take the 4 by 6. Now, add in the height, we take our 24 inches, which is our area, multiply it by 10, so I have a volume of 240 cubic inches. 24 by 10 is 240. A cubic yard is a volume equal to the volume of a box that is one yard in all dimensions. Remember, a yard is equal to three feet. Cubic yards you're going to use in construction like dirt, sand, and concrete. We don't use cubic yards that much in, in air conditioning or in HVAC. It's just not a measurement we typically use. We normally use cubic feet or cubic inches. In air conditioning, cubic measurements are used to express airflow. Airflow is measured in cubic feet per minute. This is extremely important. You have to remember this. Cubic feet per minute, CFM. When air is flowing at one CFM, the air would fill up a one cubic foot box in one minute. Has anyone in this group had air conditioning yet? Okay. There's a, I'm not sure if it says that on the next slide, no. There's a, there's a standard in air conditioning for every ton of air conditioning, which is 12,000 BTUs. So one ton of air conditioning is 12,000 BTUs. One ton of air conditioning requires 400 CFM per minute. Okay, let me say that again. One ton of air conditioning is 12,000 BTUs of heat removal per hour. So 1,200 BTU per hour. One ton of air conditioning requires 400 CFM of air per minute. Okay, 400. So if you have a two-ton system, I have to move 800 CFM of air, and it has to flow through the ductwork attached to it. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay. Liquid volume is commonly measured in different measurements, okay? We don't use square inches or whatever. We use gallons, quarts, pints, cups, and ounces. One cubic foot is equal to 7.48 gallons. There's four quarts in a gallon, two pints, and that should say in a quart. Cups are divided into ounces. Eight ounces equals one cup. And there's a, again, there's a decent chart here that helps you out. Okay, and again, some of these, I would just keep some of these charts because eventually you're, you may need it someplace. Okay, so just, just remember that these charts are here if you need them. In air conditioning, we measure oil containers in quarts or gallons. Compressor oil quantities are often stated in ounces. Water flow is normally stated in gallons, such as gallons per minute. Okay, now water flow, where ductwork we're dealing with cubic feet per minute, are piping for heating systems, for large air conditioning systems where we're moving water around, has to handle the gallons per minute of flow that I'm required to cool the space. Okay, so all of this matters. Okay, area and volume of round objects, Okay, we start talking about the area equals pi times radius squared. Am I going to want you to remember that formula? No. You'll have a formula sheet that will tell you that. But I just need you to know how it's calculated. Okay, area equals pi times radius squared. Okay, you take the radius of the circle, which is basically from the center point to any outside side. You square it, so it's radius times radius, multiplied by pi. And don't go crazy on pi. Round it off to like the second digit. 
Okay, the radius of the circle is the distance from its center to the outside of the circle. Calculate the area of the circle with a 12 inch diameter. The formula is 3.14 times 6 squared. Okay, so it comes out to 113 square inches for a circle with a 12 inch diameter. That's the area, that's not the volume, that's just the square foot. Okay. Occasionally, it's necessary to determine how round something is. Okay. So the total the total distance around the outside of the circle, which is the circumference. The formula for circumference is a little bit different. Its circumference equals pi times diameter. So you measure across, multiply it by pi. Now, when do you need a circumference of a circle? Well, think about a round piece of ductwork. Okay, I'm installing round ductwork in someone's attic, and I need to figure out how much insulation I need to purchase. That's where circumference comes in. Or I'm installing hot water heat piping or chilled water piping in someone's basement or in a large commercial building. I need to know how much insulation I need to purchase. Okay, that's where circumference comes because the insulation is flat and I have to figure out how much I have to buy to wrap it around the circular object. Okay, and again, this is what formula sheets are meant for. Circumference of a 12-inch circle would be 3.14 times 12. Okay, we have a 12-inch diameter times 3.14, which is pi come up with the answer, okay, which is 37.7 inches. Weight. We use a lot of weight measurements, okay. When we were in the shop doing some refrigerant charging a few weeks ago, we used weight all the time. Those scales actually show pounds and ounces, the refrigerant scales. Weight is measured in pounds and ounces. A pound is 16 ounces. Larger weights are measured in tons. A ton is equal to 2,000 pounds. Now, again, do not get cooling ton confused with weight ton. There is really not a relationship other than they, the first cooling measurements were how long did it take to, how long and how much energy did it take to um, melt 2,000 pounds of ice, okay? 2000, that's how they originally came out with the ton of cooling is, however, is 12,000 BTUs. So it took 12,000 BTUs in one hour to melt 2,000 pounds of ice. But a ton is equal to 2,000 pounds when we're talking weight. Grains, as I showed you on the psychrometric chart, are used to ver measure very small weight measurements. We use grains in air conditioning to measure the weight of water in the air. Again, link back to that psychrometric chart. That's why I went over that first. We use grains to measure the weight of water in the air. The quantity of refrigerant in a system can be given in pounds, ounces, or a decimal of pounds. Most charging scales do not allow technicians to enter ounce quantities greater than 16. So you have to convert the charges in ounces to pounds in ounces. You're going to divide the number of ounces by 16 to arrive at the weight in pounds. So a factory charge of 16 ounces would be 4.75 pounds. Okay. So if you have a scale that reads decimal pounds, which most of them do not, okay? You could state this charge in three ways, 76 ounces, 4.75 pounds, or four pounds, two ounces, okay? All the same weight, just with different conversions. Why do we care about that? Because all refrigerant systems that come pre-charged from the factory have a refrigerant on the label that tells you how much it came with. We have to adjust that for the length of line sets, for the conditions, and sometimes if the system is completely empty, like someone hit the line set with a lawnmower, you might have to put this refrigerant back into it. So you have to understand the weight 
in pounds and ounces. Okay? That's just one label. The red part on it is the pounds and ounces. I think there may have been an error on that last slide you were on. Where? Yeah, right at the that bottom. One? That should be four twelve ounces, not four pounds two ounces. The conversion if four point seven five pounds is correct. You're right. Let me make a note of that. Yeah. Because six Yeah, you're right. Let me make a note of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Sorry about that. Just making sure we're paying attention, right? No, I screwed up. <laughs> I dropped the one. No problem saying that. I screwed up. Okay, another label. This one's just giving us an ounces. That last label that I showed you gave pounds and ounces. This one is ounces. The charging scales will not go to 72 ounces. You have to make the conversion. And, uh, hey, uh, okay. Chris. Yeah. On that PowerPoint, yeah. it says 0.75 a pound. 0.75 a pound equals 2 ounces. That's not right. It's, yeah, it's 12 so, ounces. Yeah, someone else just brought that up. Oh, it did? My bad. Yeah. And, and yes, I dropped a one on that PowerPoint. My apologies. I will fix it. Welcome to the discussion, Jake. <laughs> okay. So, any questions on why I went over that um, PowerPoint? I don't like to do a ton of PowerPoints on these, but I didn't have that recorded for you guys. But I really needed to go over the idea of the, um, just to get everyone on the same level of why we're talking about some of this math stuff. We have to be able to do it. So, any questions on that? And some technicians will go through their entire career, and I think I put this in the discussion board post, but some technicians will go through their entire career, not use any of this stuff. You're going to be awesome technicians out there in the field. And then there's some technicians who are going to go, who are going to be with a company or decide to go a route in their careers that you're going to use more and more of this stuff as you start getting into complex troubleshooting, as you start getting into designing systems, as you start, quite honestly, getting older, okay, you're not going to be wanting to crawl around people's attics you're going to, or basements. You're going to want to start getting more on the design and being the technical support lead for a company. And you're going to move on to the troubleshooting, which is going to take you into using more and more of the math. Okay, you're going to have to use these design skills that we go over. Uh, for some of you who are going to go for state licensing, not in Pennsylvania, you may move to another state that requires licensing. Design is a big portion of their exams. It's not just technical. They assume you get that experience in the field. The design portion, the how to calculate different airflows and stuff like that. Everything we're doing in this course has to do with things that are going to be required eventually as you move up in the field. So there's a method to the madness. So bear with us as we go through the introductories of the course. Um, so what I want you guys to do today or before tomorrow, I do want you to review, again, the handout that's in your course module of the Introduction to Psychrometrics. I want you to go through the handout of the linear weight and volume measurements. That's basically what I just went over. Okay. Skip over that one up there on the applied trigonometry. I'm probably going to give you a recording on that. Um, and it's not as scary as it thinks. We're just talking about angles. And the reason we have to talk about angles is because of roots. Okay, we have to talk about angle measurements because you have to be able to calculate area with roots as we do design. That's why we talk about it. Okay. There is a lab seven here. When you open it, the piece of paper is probably going to say lab six. Just hand in the lab when you get a chance. Okay, it's due tomorrow by 1 p.m. 
Um, watch these two video lectures on psychometrics. I did them. Okay, they're actually pretty decent, if I say so myself, and it gives you a ton of information. Um, there will be a part three and four that will be assigned tomorrow. Do the discussion board post. Guys, discussion boards are my main way of giving you guys attendance, okay, for the course. They're really important. You guys got to make a good original post. I don't care about word counts, but make it worthwhile me reading. Okay, put in a good original post, and please add constructively to two other of your classmates' posts. Again, discussion boards is how I base my attendance. Okay, the only time I really take points off discussion boards, if you guys don't do those two additional posts, or if you just write I agree or something like that. I'm not going to, I just can't do it. It goes against the discussion board directions. Um, as you saw in the last course, I have been really, really lenient on discussion board postings. Again, it's all about involvement. Be involved in the discussion boards. You won't have any problems. Discussion boards are more valuable to me than quizzes because in discussion boards, I know, I know every thought process. Okay, take your time with them and do them right. Okay, tomorrow um, there will be another course announcement going up in the morning with giving you guys the information. The module isn't available on your screens yet. But we're going to continue with psychometrics tomorrow. We're going to talk more about the calculations. I will work more on the different calculations in terms of weights and stuff like that. And then we're going to move into air distribution and duct systems. I have to get this basic stuff out of the way before we can start talking about air distribution and duct systems. The other thing I want you to do is start looking at Chapter 27 in your modern refrigeration book. Again, this is talking about properties of air. The most successful techs out there, once you get past the basic fixing, installing, and stuff like that, really understand properties of air. Um, we're going to be talking about ventilation and all the other stuff that keeps an indoor environment healthy. Timing of this is almost perfect. But um, we, we do need to talk quite a lot about airflow and what air does. Do you guys have any questions for me? Okay, if not, that's all I have for this morning. Please work on the course yourself. I'm here available for email. I will answer text messages. I will even try to answer phone calls if you call me when there's not a course when I'm not on another call. Um, if you get my voicemail, if you call me, leave me a number and a time to call you back. I do return my calls. So you guys have a great rest of the day, and I look forward to reading the discussion boards. Thank you all.